Hey everyone, and welcome back to another week here on the Foundry Church YouTube channel. We're so happy that you guys came to see what God is doing in and through his church. If you're looking to stay more connected with us throughout the week, the best way to do that is to go onto our Facebook page and like us there. And if you haven't subscribed yet here on YouTube, go ahead and do so now. That way you can keep up with these. With that said, let's get into our next message in our series, Life to the Full. Well, hey, friends, welcome. As we dive into our new fall series, we're dealing with the question of, uh, is this life to the full? Is this life to the full? We're, we're jumping out of John chapter 10 in this series, and we're going to work our way through, um, through this text and really wrestle with some things. But the thing we have to do first is really grab onto the cast of characters, right? It's that time of year where we are all evaluating, if we're NFL or college fans, we're evaluating the people on our teams. We're learning the new cast of characters, especially in the college game. By the way, I'm not a Sparty fan. I don't hate them. I'm not, I'm not from here, so I can have that luxury of being like, yeah, they're pretty good. Um, but, you know, Sparty, you know, their defense looked mean last week. So if you're a Wolverine, you grind that offense up. But anyways, um, here we go. So we're looking at the cast of characters and in, in the NFL and college football. What we look at is we're like, okay, who's the quarterback? Who's going to be that kind of stud on defense who knows how to, you know, kind of lead the team? What's the cast of characters? And who's that number 87, right? Who's that guy? He's really doing good. You, you've got to learn the cast of characters. And, well, it could be like in, in War and Peace, that great literary work, and um, it's it's a phenomenal. I actually watched uh, a whole thing on it, like a, a production of it. It was really really good. And you have like this cast of characters. You have this amazing guy. This this guy is his name's Pierre. Uh, I think Bazukov or something, which is a great name, right? And he, like you know, he flexes the Bazukov. But anyway. Um, so you've got Pierre, and he's this kid who comes, he's, he's kind of a peasant kid who comes into an inheritance from this grand guy, and, and immediately the cast of characters begins to unfold. There's this wretched character of Helene, and she's a terrible person who's known as witty and sly in the, in the socialite circles, and she ensnares little Pierre and, and pulls him close, ends up marrying him, while Pierre's friend um, uh, Dolhov, he, he's this terrible guy who actually kind of uh, is is like chasing after Pierre's wife and you're like oh the cast of characters you, you can't stand them you love others you get super invested in the story when you know the cast of characters you can begin to really like you wonder what happens to them next you're leaning in constantly in our text in life to the full we are going to look at the cast of characters there's a number of different people. There's the thief, there's the robber, there's the shepherd, there's the sheep, there's the stranger, the gate, the wolf, the hired hand, and the good shepherd. These are the cast of characters, and we're going to learn their name and their number, so to speak. We're going to get to know them in this series because what we have to do is look at them and ask the question about life to the full. Is this life to the full? And if it's not, what is preventing it? So I'm going to invite you to join me as I read John chapter 10. If you have your Bibles, you can pull them out or the text will be on the screen. John chapter 10. 
Jesus says, very truly, I tell you, Pharisees, he's talking to the Pharisees, anyone who doesn't enter by the sheep pen, enter the sheep pen by the gate, but climbs in by some other way is a thief and a robber. So let's just stop right there. Two of our cast of characters come to the forefront immediately. Anyone who enters the sheep pen but doesn't come in by the gate is a thief and a robber. So who are the thief and the robber? Who are the thief and the robber? You know, in, in our world, there, there's identity theft. Someone takes your identity and kind of renames you and opens credit cards or takes out loans or purchases. Thieves and robbers take what is not theirs and treat it as their own. Actually, they treat it worse than their own. They just make use of it and then discard it. They have no, they have no loyalty to the source of what they get. They just want it for themselves. They're thieves. They, they take what is not theirs. There's robbers who seek to rob, steal, and destroy and take from others what is not theirs. I think um, just the other day, just uh, this past week, I got together with a number of the pastoral staff here at the Foundry, and we were talking about what are some of the lies that you have believed and been told about yourself over time, and the and the enemy of our soul, Satan, has used to really just remind you, this is who you are, this is who you are. Kind of, he robs your identity and puts something new on you. And it was really interesting as we were talking through the 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 question. And I said, "What? Boil it down to one word. Get it down to one word." And I'm going to give you a couple of minutes just to boil it down to one word, and then we'll talk about it. I didn't need a couple of minutes. I knew the word that the robber has tried to steal my identity in Christ and replace with stupid. You're stupid. You're dumb. You're not smart. You're never going to be smart enough. Everybody knows you're a fraud and you're just kind of a doorknob who makes jokes in class. I hear it all the time, all the time. The thief and the robber constantly reminding me of who I'm not, robbing me of my identity in Christ. The thief and the robber are, are people who steal what's not theirs and misuse the people who had it. They are thieves. The one who enters by the gate, verse 2, is the shepherd of the sheep. Two more characters show up. We have the shepherd. Who's a shepherd? Like, anybody here a shepherd? You know, one guy in the back who's a little mangy. I am, you know, but no, other than that, most likely, none of us in here are shepherds. But the shepherd is a a critical role in an agrarian society where uh, the production of wool, it's still an essential role within our world. We're just far removed from the pasture lands where it takes place. A shepherd is a critical role that, that, that stands in between the sheep and all the world that will do them harm. And here's the thing. The world doesn't have to be malevolent to do sheep harm because they're dumb as a post. They're just dumb. They're like, oh, what a neat cliff. And off they go. And you're like, oh, what's wrong with that sheep? And another one was like, that sounded like fun. And off they go. And a whole herd will walk. Like, how did sheep make it through until shepherds came along? Like, did one just get stuck by a tree? Like, well, that one survived. And there's a girl over there. Maybe we can, you know, keep making more of them. It was weird. Like, I don't know how they made it. And that's our other character, the sheep. And unfortunately, it's us. <laughs> We're the sheep in the story. The shepherd is the person of Christ. And you're going to find in the person of Christ, in the shepherd character, that he is a multifaceted individual. The person of Christ is multifaceted. I think of it like this. You could say this of Justin, the worship leader. Justin's a musician. But I'll tell you this to Marcy and his family he's a husband, he's a dad. He's a friend to many of us. He's a confidant to others. He's a son. He's, he's multifaceted. He has more than one role, right? We know him as one thing, but, but the person of Jesus has this shepherd role, and we're going to see other facets of it emerge. The sheep, we just play our part and walk off cliffs. <laughs> That's kind of what we do. Um, then we have this, chat, verse 3. The gatekeeper opens the gate for him, for the shepherd. So let's talk about the gatekeeper for a second. The gatekeeper is another facet of the individual nature of Jesus Christ. He is the shepherd, but he's also the gatekeeper. It makes me think of the scripture, I am the way, the truth, and the life, Jesus said. No man comes to the Father but by me. He's the shepherd who protects us, but he's also the gatekeeper. He's the way in. 
It goes on to say, and the sheep listen to his voice. He calls his own sheep by name. He leads them out. When he has brought out all his own, he goes on ahead of them, and the sheep follow him because they know his voice. But they will never follow a stranger. There's another person in our cast. The stranger. I, I mean, this was just too easy to talk about. You know, if, if you're a little kid, an adult says hi to you, and you're like, Oh, my word. Stranger. You know, you, like, want to run away because you know, like, I, I'm not allowed to talk to strangers. Someone who's from the outside, an unknown entity, a stranger is someone who comes into your space and there's nothing really known about them. They're an outsider now living on the inside. So they never listen or follow the voice of a stranger. They will run away from him because they don't recognize his voice. Anybody here ever get called by your mom and dad? And there is a tone my dad has when he's like, Eric. And I'm like, yes, sir. I still pop tall. I mean, my dad uses that tone. I'm like washing dishes and I don't know why. Because it's a tone, I know his voice, right? But a stranger, like how unnerving is it when someone's like, hey, Eric. And you're like, I have no idea who that is. Right? It's a, it, there's no connection there. They don't know the stranger's voice, so they'll run away from them because they don't know their voice. Chap, verse 6, Jesus used this figure of speech, but the Pharisees didn't understand what he was telling them. Therefore, Jesus said again, very truly, I tell you, I am the gate. So he's gone from gate, shepherd, gate, keeper. Now he's the gate. He's the actual means of getting in. He's the barrier and the entryway. Jesus says, I am the gate. If you need an explanation on what a gate is, find a fence. All right. Um, all who have come before me, Jesus says. Well, he said, I am the gate for the sheep. All who have come before me are thieves and robbers. They show up again. But the sheep have not listened to them. I am the gate, Jesus says. Whoever enters through me will be saved. They will come in and go out and find pasture. The thief comes only to steal, kill, and destroy. But I, Jesus says, I have come that they may have life and have life to the full. I am the good shepherd. There's a brand new facet showing up. So there's shepherds, but then there's the good shepherd. There's the good shepherd. The good shepherd knows his sheep, as Jesus goes on to say, and the sheep know him. But more than that, there is this, well, here's how it goes. I lay down my life for my sheep. I am the good shepherd. I not only stand between them and the doom they will encounter just by being dumb, but I put myself in harm's way so that they're not destroyed by forces actively looking to eat them. I, I lay down my life. I get in between them and what is trying to harm them. I get in between it. But the hired hand, the hired hand is not the shepherd and does not own the sheep. I love that. The hired hand is one of our characters. And I love this. One of the things we talk about at the Foundry, uh, if you're on staff at the Foundry, um, it's very easy. If you want to be an employee, you won't work here long. But if you want to be an owner, You'll be here for a while and you'll thrive. We don't want employees. We want owners. People who own it. People who think of it like an owner does, right? If you're an employee and your business catches on fire, you look for an exit. If you're an owner and the business catches on fire, you look for a fire extinguisher, right? There's a different mentality between an employee and an owner. And the hired hand is someone who is just there to get a little benefit from watching the sheep. So when true danger comes... They flee. They're not the shepherd. They don't own the sheep. Do you hear the love of Jesus in this? He's saying, you are mine. I love you. I want to possess you. I will treat you as though you're my very own. So when, when the hired hand sees the wolf coming, he abandons the sheep and runs away. So there's another person in our cast of characters, the wolf. The wolf, this image of something on the prowl, something that where you see one wolf, you know there's a few others out there. They travel in a pack, 
And the wolf is lethal if you're a sheep because you have no horns. You have no teeth other than grass eaters. Your hooves are worthless in a fight, and you're basically a walking pillow, right? You are dead in the water. If a wolf and a sheep lock up, what's going to happen in this is the wolf is always going to win. The wolf will always win. Who is the wolf? He's coming in, he's a predator, and he's seeking to destroy, to physically consume the sheep. So the hired hand runs when he sees the wolf. He abandons the sheep, he runs away, continuing on. Then the wolf attacks the flock and he scatters it. The hired man runs away because he is a hired hand and he cares nothing for the sheep. I am the good shepherd. I know my sheep and my sheep know me just as the Father knows me and I know the Father and I lay my life down for the sheep. I have other sheep that are not in this pen. This is where for us who aren't Jewish, that's really good news. That's an important part for us who come from the outside because he's going to bring them in. It says, I must bring them also. They too will listen to my voice and there shall be one flock and one shepherd. The reason my father loves me is that I lay down my life only to take it up again. No one takes it from me, but I lay it down of my own accord. I have authority to lay my life down, and I have authority to take it back up again. This command I received from my father. John 10.10. The thief comes only to steal, kill, and destroy, but the good shepherd the gatekeeper, the gate, the shepherd, the Lord Jesus Christ says, I have come that they may have life and have it to the full. So let me ask you this. What is, what is life to the full? What is life to the full to us? Is it full schedules? Is it being so busy that you can barely get enough sleep because you've got so many commitments? Is it full trophy cases? Is it giant heads of deer with massive bones growing out of their head hanging on your walls? Is it full bellies, full bank accounts, full closets, full shoe racks? Is it a page on Facebook? Is it your story, uh, your snap, whatever, full of likes, follows, and retweets? What is life to the full? What makes us feel full? What in the end makes life feel full and satisfying? satisfying and, and like enriched. Think of it this way. If I had two dinner guests up here, right, and one person I sat down and I gave them like roast beef, mashed potatoes, green beans. I'm going to throw a biscuit in there because I like a biscuit. And a biscuit, you know, like a salad um, for your heart and then pie with ice cream on top. You're like, boom, dinner, eat up. I mean, you'd be full after that, right? And the person next to him, I put the calorie equivalent of that meal in jet puffed marshmallows on their plate. Same amount of calories, who's going to feel full? Same amount of calories, what we burn, but one of them is going to feel satisfied and full. The other's going to have to lay on their left side and they'll be like, oh God, I'll go into missions. Just please don't let me throw up these marshmallows. I feel so sick, right? They're not going to feel full. They'll feel sick with what they have. The reality is for you and I, we have to understand when we live a life on marshmallows, there's no satisfaction. There's no life to the full. So what is life to the full? I want to take a minute and maybe whet your appetite for what's to come. Because as we walk through this series, what I want to do is help us understand that there are some full things that are revealed in this. First of all, we're going to explore the fullest perspective. The fullest perspective. God sees any, everything from beginning to end. There's some great theological words that have been given to us that define God's perspective, the fullest perspective. One of them is omniscient. God is omniscient. You can kind of find the word science in there, right? Omniscient means all-knowing. He knows everything. God's never been like, whoa, totally didn't see that coming. You know, that's never happened. God's omniscient. He knows all. God's omnipresent. He is everywhere in every moment. Remember the other week when we talked, Psalm 139, where can I go from your spirit? Where can I hide from your presence? The end of the sea to the other side of the horizon, the darkness, the grave, anywhere I go, you're there. He's omnipresent. He's everywhere at all times. 
And finally, he's omnipotent. He's all-powerful. He's all-powerful. God has not ceded his authority to anyone. He remains the sovereign, omnipotent God of the universe. And one of the things, and I love this because if you're thinking about profession of faith, we really unpack these and we talk about them in the class. And these kind of terms matter a lot when we look at understanding the fullest perspective. The fullest perspective. You and I see very small. As Paul says, we see through a glass darkly. We see through a tinted glass, so it's hard to make it out. We can't really see. And what I love about that is this. We just don't see big enough to make a good judgment call. Who here's ever been to Crane's Orchard? Anybody? Yeah, yeah, love it. They charge us extra to pick our own apples, and we call that family fun. I just see people, carry them, little three-year-old pulling a cart, my legs, well, if you want apple crisp, um, it's just good Christian family fun. But um, here's the thing, you go to Crane's, you get your apples, and then it's like the kids are like, oh, can we do the corn maze? Sure. So you go into this 10-foot tall maze of corn, and uh, where city folk go to die. <laughs> like, oh, this is, this is where it ends. And you're running around and you're trying to find your way out. And when you can't find your way out, because 10 foot tall corn is blinding you, and you look through and all you see is a forest of green, you're like, well, at least there's corn if we never get out. But what do you do when you want to find out where you're at? You go to the bridge in the middle of the maze, you climb up on it, and you stand up above the corn. And all of a sudden, you have a different perspective. You're not trapped in the tyranny of a small view. You're standing above it all, and you're looking at it from above. It's a fuller perspective, and God has the fullest perspective. The next thing is the fullest engagement. God calls us to a life of not being preoccupied by little things. Has anybody ever done this? You get home, you pull in the driveway, and you think, how did I get here? Anybody else? And you think, I should go back and check the roadways for accidents and dead animals. Like, you just like, you just drive and you're kind of like not there. And you, it kind of sends a shiver through you because you realize you're like, wow, I was really not engaged. How many of us go through life just like that? What would it be like to be fully present in your life? to be fully present in the life that God gave you, the life that God knit together and not let life pass you by. Because when we let life pass us by, we let the opportunity for the calling and the purposes of God to pass us by as well. So we understand that we're called to the fullest engagement. We're called to the fullest enjoyment. There's a whole book of the Bible dedicated to joy. It's a book of Philippians. God wants us to enjoy this life. It's a gift. It's a really good life. And we want to walk with you and, and see how we can enjoy every part of this life, how we can make life matter from the work to the rest to the fun, how to really engage and fully enjoy it. It's not wrong to enjoy life. If you've been taught that joy, like really enjoying life is wrong, you need to get a reset. Smiling is not a sin in church. Smiling and enjoying your life is not, well, here's the thing. Life's not supposed to be a relentless grind. There's supposed to be times of joy. And we want to see fullest enjoyment of our lives. The good, the bad, and the ugly. We have joy that endures through circumstances. And finally, fullest love. The cornerstone of our faith is Jesus Christ. Jesus Christ. And you and I need to fully grasp what he has done for you and for me. Because when we grasp how much he loves us, once we know that and understand his grace, we can't be the same. We don't live the same anymore. All of a sudden, our fullest perspective of love is, is like, whoa. We see how much we're loved. You're capable then not only of receiving love, but you can actually begin to love others in a way that reflects the gospel. It's unconditional, right? It's that real, complete, unconditional love of God. So what really keeps us from having life to the full? What keeps us from life to the full? I would say we can go back to our cast of characters and look at them. First of all, the stranger. We're going to talk and learn to recognize stranger danger. Stranger danger in our, um, I love that phrase. I just think it's so, it's such a good mom phrase. Um, and especially in the movie Paddington. Anybody see that? 
I, I love that movie. Um, but when they're walking through the the, tur- the train station, they're like, oh, stranger danger, there's a bear. You know, in their little British way, and you're like, Shouldn't it be bear danger? But anyways, um, so stranger danger. We're going to learn to recognize stranger danger. Jesus says if we listen to his voice, we will know it. We will know the voice of Jesus, and it means we will not recognize the voice of a stranger and we'll stop. We won't be led astray by fancy teaching, false doctrine, and things that tickle our ears but kill our souls. We're going to learn about stranger danger. We're going to learn about the thief. Because Jesus was referring to those who falsely claimed to be the Messiah in that. He says, all who have come before me were thieves and robbers, but the sheep didn't listen to him. We're going to talk about the thief, those who came before Jesus and took from people rather than served them. Took from them and didn't take care of them. So what is a thief in our lives? Anything that claims to save you is a thief and a robber. Activities relationships, investments that seek to kill, steal, and destroy our lives are thieves and robbers. One of the greatest thieves of our time right now is the addiction of our lives to social media. Am I liked? Am I loved? Am I affirmed? Steal, kill, and destroy. You don't have to do it all in one big foul swoop. You can do it slowly, moment by neglected moment. Finally, we'll talk about the wolf. The wolf is the enemy of the sheep. A wolf sneaks into the pen, and he's not sneaking in to just steal the sheep. He's not like, oh, yeah, I'm going to sell this sheep on the black market. No, he's going to eat them. He's going to eat them. He's going to literally chew on them till they're food, destroy and consume them. That's what the wolf does. It's often um, an idea in the Bible, wolves are often depicted as pretending to be some, something else. So we have the term, it's a wolf in sheep's clothing, right? It's a wolf in sheep's clothing. I was watching Looney Tunes with my kids this summer up at the cottage, and uh, the wily e. coyote dressed up as a sheep. I was like, oh, there he is. And then Sam, the dog, wadonk, he punched him. And it, it was great. It was a very violent cartoon. My childhood was riddled with those. But um, I love the idea of sheep coming in, and they think, oh, that looks pretty much like a sheep. But it's a wolf in sheep's clothing. They come in from outside the community, and they scatter the sheep. So here's one of the ways we're going to understand this. Wolves cause fear. They cause disunity. And they're keen on creating deception. We need to understand this, that we stand at the opportunity to choose one of two different lives. Life to the full or life full-ish. Kind of, yeah, I'll take whatever comes my way. I'll live at the tyranny of the urgent. Or do you want life to the full? Do you want to keep satisfying yourself with the kind of quick, instant, tasty morsels of this life, constantly living whatever your appetite desires, you're constantly at the risk of believing lies, being robbed of your joy, your purpose, being scattered, deceived, and disunified? Or do you want to have life in all its fullness, the fullness of life created for you to live? And it's centered on Jesus Christ. It's centered on Jesus Christ. Which life do you want? The immediate, temporary, that satisfies for a second or the life that has a consistent, abiding joy and hope that is found only in the person of Christ. When we center our lives on him, that's the question. Would you join me in a life to the full? Pray with me. Lord Jesus Christ, uh, today we just pause and we look to you for the hope and the clarity of what our life is. God, we look to you for hope because when we recognize how much of our life is not rooted in the fullness of you, there will be despair that we face. So we ask for hope when we see the emptiness of what we're consuming and a part of. We ask for joy as we turn our hearts towards you and chase after the one who gives gives us and promises us not only life, but life to the full. May we be people who live in the fullness of you, Jesus Christ. For the glory of your name, And for the purposes of your kingdom in this world, we ask, God, give us the courage to be people who live life to the full in partnership and union with the good shepherd, the gate, the gatekeeper, the one who has stood in the gap for us and redeemed us. We pray this all in Jesus' name. Amen. 
Hey, thanks again for joining us for this week's message. If you're looking to prepare yourself for next week's, what you can do is you can click the link below in the description and that'll take you to our weekly devotions page. Devotions are a crucial part of our weekly rhythm here at The Foundry. We really hope that God spoke something powerful into your life today and we hope that you'll join us again next week.